Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Assalatu Wassalam ala Rasulillah. Welcome to Tatsis University and I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest speaker, Daniel Hakukudju. And Daniel was born in Houston, Texas. He attended Harvard University where he studied physics and philosophy. He completed a master's degree in philosophy at Tufts University. And he writes and lectures on contemporary issues surrounding Muslims and modernity. He has spoken at universities and mosques around the US and his work has been featured in outlets such as the Washington Post, the Atlantic, CNN, Al Jazeera, and public discourse, Mashable, and First Things. He teaches as an adjunct faculty member at Respect Graduate School, and you can write his writings at um, muslimskeptic.com. And as you may already, most of you know, uh, Brother Daniel was invited to speak at Tufts University, and he, uh, because of pressures from outside groups of Tufts, he was disinvited. And Alhamdulillah, uh, as Allah says, perhaps you may hate something, but it's good for you. So, uh, Brother Daniel is here at Tufts on the same day that he was supposed to speak at. And not only did he speak at Tufts, but he also spoke at MIT and uh, Harvard University. And on, on topics that even they, he wasn't even uh, planning to speak on. And Alhamdulillah, they were very well received by everyone. And we knew through the disinvitation that happened how much people are excited and interested in, uh, in, in these topics and like discussing them. So we'd like to thank Brother Daniel and he's an inspiration to a lot of us here how, how in, in living in this society how much we can be pressured by, um, by like outside ideologies that don't adhere with the Islamic values. So without further ado, also we're gonna, um, before Brother Daniel starts speaking, we're gonna do a, a quick uh, Quran recitation by Brother Faris, and then we'll start with Brother Daniel. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, Surah uh, the Cave, and say the truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers a fire whose walls will surround them, and if they call for relief, they will be relieved within, they will be relieved with water like murky oil, with, which scalds their faces. Wretched is the drink, and evil is the resting place. Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deeds, indeed, we will not allow to be lost the reward of any who did well in deeds. Those will have gardens of perpetual residence, beneath them rivers will flow. They will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold and will wear green garments of fine silk and brocade. 
reclining therein on adorned couches. Excellent is their reward, and good is the resting place. May Allah make us of them. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Uh, thank you for inviting me here uh, to Tufts. I graduated uh, in 2010 with my master's degree from the philosophy department here. Um, and before that, I was at Harvard um, and did a degree in physics and philosophy. Um, so I'm very happy to be back on campus, have a lot of uh, happy memories uh, living near campus and eating at Carmichael, um, delicious cafeteria food. Uh, so I'm glad that I had the opportunity to come. Uh, there was this slight controversy of um, my invitation being rescinded at the last minute. Um, and, you know, as uh, the moderator mentioned, uh, it only led to more opportunities. So I think that ultimately um, the truth will come out, you know, people who are willing to speak the truth uh, and abide by the truth. It might seem like there's overwhelming public pressure um, and negativity, but um, we should always have that faith that Allah is uh, going to make uh, the Dean victorious and the truth victorious and we should look forward to that and have faith in that. So the topic of today's discussion is the dangers of liberalism and before getting into the topic let me just define what I mean by liberalism. Um, we tend to use it in a political sense meaning uh, you have the liberal left wing and the conservative right wing and that's not exactly the meaning that I want to focus on. Liberalism is a philosophical idea, and so I want to discuss liberalism uh, as philosophy. And it is the idea that originated within the Enlightenment, uh, within uh, Britain and France and Europe generally. Um, and there are certain figures, of Enlightenment figures associated with developing um, liberal philosophy. And uh, the basic idea of philo philosophical liberalism is that morality depends on maximizing freedom, liberty, equality. Um, these three main points um, constitute the essence of liberalism. And anything that increases liberty, freedom, equality is good. Um, advances progress and so forth. Anything that opposes liberty, equality, and freedom is bad, evil, destructive, holds the human being down. Um, so this is the philosophy uh, of liberalism and there are many sub-philosophies that fall under the overall liberal paradigm. So if you understand liberty in, in the philosophical sense, then the left wing uh, or the Democratic Party in, in America is, you know, no one will say we're opposed to maximizing liberty, whether they're Democrat or Republican. They just have different ways of approaching that. So, for example, does uh, tighter gun control laws maximize or does it increase liberty or decrease liberty? Well, depending on who you ask, um, whether on the political left or the right, they'll differ whether gun control increases liberty or not, but both sides agree that liberty is what is important here. Uh, maximizing freedom and rights, that's what's important. They just have disagreements on exactly how to achieve that. Uh, and that's purely within the domain of American politics, but even you can look at other political systems like socialism, communism, even fascism, they're all concerned with this, they all come from the liberal tradition broadly, philosophical liberalism, and they're all concerned with this question of how do we free human beings and how do we get grant, what kind of political and economic system will confer the most liberty, equality, and freedom uh, to society and the individual. So this is uh, just to give you some basic definition so that you know what I'm really talking about. So um, now to switch gears slightly, let me ask a basic question. How many of you know Muslims who have um, left Islam? 
within your family or classmates? Just raise your hand if you know any Muslims who have left Islam. Okay, um, how many of you know young Muslims who are seriously questioning their faith and are approaching leaving Islam? Okay, pretty much everyone um, raised their hand. Uh, I think that there's different ways to understand this. We can understand it as just chance, random occurrence, um, you know, people come into the faith, they leave the faith, there's not really a rhyme or reason to it, that's just the way the world is. Another way to approach, is, approach it is that there are specific uh, trends and specific ideas and ideologies that are in no subtle way affecting the minds of Muslims that are encouraging them and getting them to see Islam as backwards, retrograde, and outmoded, and something that should be discarded in favor of some other goal, such as freedom, equality, liberty. And if we look at the history of liberalism and how liberalism developed um, and how it was deployed throughout the world, this was the deliberate goal. Liberalism was a tool that was used against the Muslim world in colonial times, in uh, the 20th, 19th century, 20th century, and in, in the 21st century uh, up until today. And so we have to recognize this, and we have to be aware of these dangers, and we have to be aware of how this is happening. Because if we don't understand how it's happening, we can't address it in an adequate way. And I just wanted to, the whole point of my talk today, and I'll try to keep it to about 45 minutes, is to explain exactly how this has happened and the kind of reflections that we as a community need to have within our current context. Um, and one of the things I emphasize to the places, in the different places that I talk, um, usually it's, you know, mosques, masjid communities, and I try to emphasize that as a community within the American context, we need to have a 100-year vision of our future and not just a short-term five-year vision, okay? Because if you're blinded um, by your current circumstances, then you're going to make decisions that will threaten or endanger your 100-year future. And I feel that the Muslim community has gotten into this habit of being too reactionary to current circumstances and forgetting the 100-year game plan, okay? And I'll give you a specific example. Uh, ever since, I'd say about 2000, the year 2000, 2001, um, the Muslim community has been shifting more to the left politically. And this has been from political convenience. Uh, Republicans since the Bush era have instituted all kinds of uh, negative policies and measures that have affected Muslims overseas as well as domestically, and we'll talk more a little bit about that. Obama, to a large extent, extended those policies, but the Muslim community seemed to be blind um, to the anti-Muslim policies that uh, Barack Obama implemented. And I often get in trouble for saying that because so many Muslims love Barack Obama and see him as the savior of the Muslim community when the reality is that um, you can read the report from the ACLU, for example, that says, and they're, li they're liberal oriented, that no significant policy that George Bush uh, and the Republicans had implemented in their term in office, two terms in office, was discontinued by Obama as far as Muslim rights are concerned domestically and in terms of foreign policy. There were superficial changes, but by and large things remained the same or even were expanded. Um, and this is what the ACLU is saying. That was their assessment of Barack Obama. And they would point things to like surveillance, right? The surveillance state only expanded Spying on Muslims only expanded um, in the Obama era. Um, so things like that, um, the Muslim community needs to be more aware of. But then Donald Trump won the election last year and was inaugurated this year. 
and that has shifted the Muslim community even more to the left. And there are reasons for this. Donald Trump is very openly anti-Muslim in how he speaks and the policies that he advocates for. Um, but there's a cost, and I don't feel like the Muslim community in America has really uh, evaluated objectively the cost of allying with the left. Okay, And this is an example of a short-term calculation that, okay, Donald Trump is in office, we need to make political alliances with the left. And that might make sense uh, from a communal policy perspective, but what, what is the tangible cost of that? Uh, one of the main costs is that you, as a community, have to sacrifice some of your teaching and positions on the issue of sexual morality. So the issue of LGBT, right? Um, which is something that is not controversial as far as Islamic ethics are concerned, that same-sex behavior is prohibited, um, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A, but there is very clear ethics that as Muslims we all must abide by. And the cost of allying with uh, the left wing, which is very aggressively, almost militantly, um, pro-LGBT and you know advancing certain kinds of rights claims regarding same-sex marriage and so forth. Um, the questioning of gender, transgenderism is now uh, increasingly popular and politicized issue. What is the cost of Muslim, the Muslim community adopting these uh, kinds of views um, tacitly or explicitly? Now you're seeing increasing, increasingly Muslim American leaders saying that the Muslim community needs to embrace LGBT, the Muslim community needs to stand for all of these uh, specific policy points, otherwise we're hypocrites, how can we criticize um, the Islamophobes but then be homophobic ourselves? These are the way that these issues are framed, and it's a very problematic frame but it's seemingly compelling to the average Muslim and definitely amongst the younger generation. But if, you're, if you as a young person in college or in high school are adopting these kinds of views and perspectives, then how are you going to understand the Quran you know, when Allah is speaking about Qawm Lut? Or how are you going to understand Islamic sexual ethics when you read certain hadith or you read certain opinions from uh, ulama and scholars of the past, what is going to be your internal state? You're going to feel a lot of tension, to say the least. You might feel despair, you might feel confusion, um, and then this is going to cause a problem for you in your faith and may even leave, lead you to leave the faith. So, if that's the kind of struggle and confusion that a um, large percentage of our youth are going through as a direct result of our political as our uh, direct result of our community's political stance then fine you might win political points in the 5 year short term or 8 years you know if Donald Trump wins another term in office but you've lost an entire generation of Muslims. You've lost an entire generation of Muslims and that will have a big effect, okay, because that's one generation and that compounds with the next generation and the next generation, such that in three years will there even be Muslims in America? And it, if there won't be, it's not going to be because, in my humble opinion, it's not going to be because Donald Trump, you know, in, you know, throws us all in concentration camps. That's not going to be the reason. The reason is that we just have self attrited You know, the Muslims have just left. And there's statistics about this that I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. So my point is, as a community, we need to have a broader vision and a broader calculus that has a hundred-year perspective. And this is the example of the prophets as well. And I can give you many examples of the depth and, and the distance of their vision and how they were thinking about their community and the tangible decision that, decisions that they were making 
in the here and now. And that's not to say that the immediate circumstances aren't important and that we shouldn't be strategic and wise and as a community and how we navigate the waters only when there's this when that comes at the expense of our future is that problematic and so we should not have this hyper focus on islamophobia that totalizes our entire concern such that we forget the danger of the left and the danger of liberalism as a philosophy primarily on our future our collective future in this country and so i think that what is most productive uh, for us to do in order to inculcate that 100 year vision is to think about how we develop our youth and what kinds of trends and ideologies our, our children and young people are subscribing to and what's disturbing is this um, what we can call a de-muslimization of Muslim youth de-muslimization of Muslim youth and I'm using de-muslimization for a specific reason I'll tell you the significance of that in just a moment but we're what we're seeing is a trend of cultural Islam Islam as culture and Islam as political identity to be a Muslim means to subscribe to very particular um, modes of dress you know if you're uh, female you wear the hijab um, if you're male, maybe you have some facial hair, um, you dress a certain way, you talk a certain way, um, but it's just superficial. Um, when it comes to actual beliefs, then it's a free-for-all, okay? So long as you claim to be Muslim, that's all it takes to be a Muslim. Um, that's what being a political identity means. It's just on your own claim and there's no necessary beliefs that you have to subscribe to or practices. The way that I summarize this is Muslim by body, Muslim in terms of your body, but not in terms of heart and mind. And again, you'll find Muslim young people today who will subscribe to all kinds of un-Islamic, anti-Islamic perspectives, um, and proudly so, but they still consider themselves unapologetically Muslim. Right? And this is the rallying cry. We're unapologetically Muslim. And they go to marches and rallies and shout this. But what does that actually mean? Is there any content to your Islam? Or is it just a culture? Or is it just a political identity and a political movement? And again, I can give you examples in terms of sexual ethics, um, the lack of commitment to Islamic law in general, um, and we can define that further in Q&A if you're interested. Or this idea of universalism, that as long as you're a good person, it doesn't really matter if you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, or atheist, agnostic, and so forth. As long as you're a good person, those differences are just superficial, right? And that's, you know, a very destructive kind of view. And you can see how it's conducive to apostasy. You can see how if you think that, well, I'm a good person. Well, why do I need to believe in God at all? Why do I need to believe in things like heaven and hell and the afterlife? Why do I need to struggle with myself to oppose my desires and to act in uh, correct, Islamically correct ways? It's such a burden. Why should I do that as long as I'm a good person? Uh, so this is something that you'll hear over and over again from young people and I get messaged all the time uh, online about this kind of question like why do we need to accept Islam as long as you're a good person they just don't feel any motivation internally um, or reason that would motivate them intellectually or spiritually to abide by or subscribe to Islam and what I'm arguing is that this is a direct result of a cultural Islam, Islam as political identity. And so I'm making a lot of claims here about the state of the American Muslim community, but let me back that up with a few statistics. So these are all um, Pew surveys. 52% um, of, of U.S. Muslims believe that traditional Islam must be reinterpreted. 
52% believe that traditional Islam must be reinterpreted. Over half of Muslims say that, U.S. Muslims, that society needs to uh, accept homosexuality and accept um, same-sex marriage. Half of Muslims in America believe this. What's significant about this statistic is that over the past 10 years, there's a 20 percentage point increase in, Muslim, in Muslims who say that society needs to accept homosexuality. Whereas for Christian groups, it's only been a 10% increase. So we're more than double outpacing uh, Christians in our acceptance of this specific kind of sexual ethic. Uh, another very startling statistic is with attrition rates, meaning what percentage of people who are raised as Muslims continue to identify as Muslims in adulthood? What percentage would you estimate? So it's, it's just about a little over 70%. That means about 30% of people who are raised as Muslims when they reach adulthood, they no longer identify, either because they've converted to another religion, or they've left in religion entirely, they're atheists, or they're just non-affiliated. And that's really the fastest growing religion. Um, there's this kind of cliche that, oh, Islam is the fastest growing religion. The numbers don't back that up. The fastest growing religion is a new category um, that has been identified by the sociologists studying this of the nons, non-affiliated, meaning people who generally have a sense that God exists, may or may not exist, but religion in an organized way doesn't really have much relevance to life. So why should I bother um, subscribing to Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or any other organized religion? I'm just non-affiliated. That's the fastest growing religion in the world, um, or the fastest growing category uh, in the world, and definitely in the US. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing today. Let's look at how liberalism has affected Muslim history and Muslim civilization. And so I'm from, I'm of a Persian background. Both of my parents are from Iran. And for the most part, my extended family is secular. Okay, um, Many of them don't even believe in God. Um, most of them don't have any connection to Islam in terms of their practice or their beliefs. I would characterize them as being more secular and liberal, even the ones who are still in Iran. So maybe about more than half are in Iran and then the rest are in the US or Canada. And religion is not something that is on their radar. And I think that's something to reflect on. You have a culture and a region that has been Muslim, deeply Muslim, for over a thousand years. Okay, how is it that within one or two or three generations that civilization has crumbled in such a dramatic way in the past 100, 150 years, 200 years? Again, is it something that just naturally happens? Um, this is the atheist's contention um, that as education improves and increases, um, people naturally become less superstitious and leave religion and become secular and atheistic. This is their uh, anthropology of civilization. But there's a, there's a simpler explanation and a more compelling one that I referred to earlier is that there is a deliberate process to condition the Muslim mind and to control and manipulate the Muslim mind into rejecting his own religion. And we can look at the process of colonization in the Muslim world and imperialism 
from Europe and how liberalism played into that as a tool to uh, catalyze, as a catalyst for bringing secularization and the rejection of Islam and leaving of Islam in the Muslim world. And so I, I'm coming from Persian background. If you're coming from a Turkish or South Asian or North African um, background, then you have probably noticed the same things with your own families. Um, and I think this is something that we can reflect on and trace exactly what the causes of this were. So when we look at the history of colonization, the target number one, target number one of the colonizers were the religious institutions, the madrasa, the madaris, the uh, tariqa, right? The institutions of Islamic learning and development of Islamic, uh, uh, the development of the believer. That was target number one. And there were different ways that they attacked these institutions. One was to defund the awqaf, the public funding for those institutions. Um, dismantling those institutions by discrediting their, the scholars, the ulama and portraying scholars as these kinds of retrograde people who are committed to just blindly following the past and are not interested in progress. They're not interested in joining the civilized world. If you want to be part of the civilized world, you need to throw off you know, this old-fashioned concern with uh, you know, the Islamic sciences, uh, how to uh, maintain purity, tahara, how to pray, how to uh, pay zakat, all of the details of being a Muslim and being a true believer, that's fine. Uh, we're not saying that that's bad, but okay, it's not a priority right now. We want to join civilization, so we need to emphasize the sciences. We need to emphasize these particular European disciplines and European modes of thought. And our institutions need to be structured in order to teach that and to get Muslims to jump onto that program of Europeanization. And so this is how they discredited and dismantled traditional Islamic institutions. And that happened just you know within the past 200 years. And it's, it leads to a domino effect. And we're seeing the fruits of that. We have been seeing the fruits of that for the past few generations. Because as soon as you cut off the source of knowledge, ilm, okay, so we're Muslims, so knowledge comes from Allah through the Prophet, peace be upon him, and through the teaching of the Sahaba and the Salaf and the generations of scholars. And that's the wellspring. That's the wellspring of life, okay, how to flourish and how to live in the best way in this life in preparation for the next life. So if you cut off that stream, if you, you know, if you cut off the live stream, okay, then you're not, you're going to see, okay, you won't see the impact that same generation, but within two or three generations, then slowly people are starting to leave. People are starting to leave little by little until before you know it, everyone is gone. And you have entire families, such as my family, where, for the most part, as I characterize it, they are secular. So, again, am I just speaking speculatively? Is there any data? Is there any history? Are there any texts to back up what I'm telling you? There are. You can read the work of the colonizers because they're very explicit about their project. They're very explicit on how to control and manipulate the Muslim world. And why would they do this, right? Are they just, you know, evil people that had it, had it out for Muslims and had it out for Islam? Well, no, they, ha they were motivated by the desire to control Muslim populations, to take advantage of Muslim populations, to get Muslims to support their European colonizers with open arms and open hearts. That was their intention, and it's very profitable. There's a clear economic motive for that. 
and also a nationalistic motive. If you have a civilizing mission, you want to civilize people to bring them to the light of your tradition, which is liberalism, the Enlightenment, then you're motivated to go to wherever that you're militarily conquering, occupying, imperializing, um, and get the local population to see you not as an enemy, but as a savior. Okay, so there is a motivation for them to manipulate Muslims and to get Muslims to abandon their own tradition and abandon Islamic law and the Sharia to accept European law. Okay, and that was the first step in making the Muslim world, reshaping it in the image of Enlightenment Europe within the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. And so I mentioned Lord Cromer, and Lord Cromer is very explicit about this. He says that we can't just go to Muslims and say, abandon the Sharia. We can't go to Muslims and say, abandon Islam. Because if we're that direct, the Muslims will fight us. Like literally, they'll fight us off if we go and say that. What we should say instead is, hey, Muslims, it's fine, you have Islam, but you need to reform Islam. You need to reform Islam and bring it into the light of modernity. Because look, times change, and if you stick to these outmoded ways of thinking, then you're going to fall further and further behind, materially, economically, and politically. So just simply reform your religion, and if that's the message that we go to the Muslim world with, then they will embrace us. And we, what we need to do specifically is to take those reform-minded Muslims, we need to make sure to take them to Europe, to acculturate them to European values, to educate them in European institutions. And we, the, the, these are the de-Muslimized Muslims. The de-Muslimized Muslims. And that's the term that I used before. It's coming from Lord Cromer. And so what he said explicitly is that the de-Muslimized Muslim is not really a Muslim. Reformed Islam is not really Islam. That's how you destroy Islam by reforming it because all it does is destroy Islamic law, Islamic ethics, and that's how we can manipulate and control the Muslim population and therefore the Muslim world. So what should be our reaction to this as Muslims today? Think about what has been lost. Think about what civilization has been lost. Islamic civilization with its rich history is in tatters. It has been ripped apart and systematically destroyed. I don't know about you, but that makes me very sad. That makes me very sad and you feel that sense of loss. And every day, I feel that. Every day, I feel that sense of loss. Because my family, right? These are the people that I love. But, you know, they're on a certain path. And you do your best. But every day, okay, you're confronted with that. So it's, it's very personal. And sometimes people criticize me for being too emotional and being too uh, aggressive in the kinds of critiques that I make. But if you feel what I feel every day, it's torture. It's, it's really torture when you realize exactly how things have unfolded and how so many people, our brothers and sisters around the world and ourselves, have been duped. We've been tricked. We've been manipulated. How does that make you feel? So we really should feel that and we should viscerally feel it. And the way to respond is to identify the source of the problem and to think about it clearly, rationally, and understand how do we prevent this from continuing? Because the process is ongoing. Right? 
what I asked you at the beginning was how many of your friends and family you know who are considering leaving Islam or who have left Islam. And it's the same issues, it's the same process that is doing this, right? It's the internalization and the acceptance of liberalism that encourages Muslims to view their faith, to view Islam, to view Islamic law as retrograde backwards and contrary to progress and advancement. This is the same message that was given to our ancestors uh, 200 years ago, 250 years ago in the colonial period. And it's the same message that's been being given in the United States and Europe and the West in general to our youth today. And so let me give you an example of how this works. I'll give you two examples that will make it a little bit more real for you. Um, think about hijab, okay? And hijab, when it's discussed um, today, it's always uh, framed in terms of choice and empowerment, okay? And so Muslim women insist that I wear hijab, but it's my choice. No one has forced me. No one has oppressed me. Um, I'm empowered by my, you know, wearing the hijab, on and on and on. All of this language that's used by Muslim women, this is all liberal language, okay? Cho the importance of choice, okay? Because the lack of choice means the lack of liberty. Um, the uh, lack of oppression. I haven't been forced to do this. I'm liberated. Hijab actually liberates me. This language is very explicit. And I'm not going to give you a deeper critique of freedom, liberty, and equality today. There's much that can be said about that. But what I want you to reflect on is the language that's being used. Because if you internalize a certain form of language, then you internalize the ideas and the concepts that underlie that language, and that can have many unintended de detrimental effects on your faith. But continuing on the topic of hijab, what the colonizers did was said that Look at European women and how they dress. Look at European women and how they behave and how they act with the opposite gender and how they hold themselves. And so you condition Muslims to look at that image of a European woman as the ideal to be strived for and to view that as the natural way to dress and behave. And the way that Muslim women dress as unnatural and contrary to that natural state and that default. And so if you internalize a certain vision of what it means to be appropriately dressed, then anything that diverges from that is suddenly a burden, is suddenly a cultural accretion, is suddenly something that you can dispense with, right? And our sisters are going through this every day. Right, and you just by the way that they, they talk about the hijab, that it's a burden. So I either will okay, it's a burden, so I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to wear hijab, or it's a burden, but I'm going to maintain the hijab because of love of Allah, love of my religion. But both sides agree that it's a burden, that it's something that extra that you have to do in order to. Um, abide by Islamic law. So this is, so the problem is the underlying mentality. And it happens through conditioning. Conditioning and the implantation. You know, have you, maybe you're familiar with the movie Inception. Okay, what's the idea behind this? It's a popular movie, science fiction, uh, directed by Christopher Nolan, British filmmaker. The idea is that if you plant an idea in the human mind, and make it seem like that person has thought of the idea himself, then you can easily manipulate the person. Okay? So you, this is what inception is. And that's the, that's what liberalism does, is it implants certain ideas and makes Muslims think that it is of their own volition and their own mindset that they are reforming their religion and they are, um, trying to modify their religion to come into conformity with 
the modern world or to make their religion more tolerant or accepting or whatever else it is. And by the way, I, there's nothing wrong with tolerance. Um, don't get me wrong. That's an extended discussion, but we have to look at what is tolerance in the Islamic tradition and what is meant by that according to Islamic ethics as opposed to um, alternative worldviews. So this is uh, the example of hijab. How about the example of sex and sexual behavior? If you tell people that to be a healthy person, whatever desires you have, you need to act on them. And if you hold yourself back and you restrict yourself, that's unhealthy and that's going to cause psychological harm, it's going to cause trauma, it's going to cause cognitive dissonance and all kinds of uh, dysfunction if you tell people that enough and you condition them to think like that, then they'll view Islam and its sexual ethics as something very backwards and harmful, literally harmful. I don't want to be psychologically dysfunctional, so we need to change the religion. We need to clearly these what God has said for this 7th century Arabia doesn't apply today, or they'll find different ways to justify reforming Islamic sexual ethics. And you can look at what's taught in the psychology textbooks, or what the APA recommends, and what they believe to be natural and conducive to mental health, psychological health. And they say explicitly, like, if a person has desires and uh, for a certain kind of uh, sexual practice, then they need to pursue that. And to hold yourself back from that is uh, oppressive and psychologically maladaptive. And that's the recommendation that they give. If you go and go to therapy, that's the problem with uh, Muslims going to uh, certain psychologists who don't understand the Islamic perspective. That w that's what they'll recommend say that, okay, you need to go out and have a more uh, active party life or social life. You need to you know, get on Tinder. You need to start finding, why are you holding yourself back? Why are you restricting yourself? Oh, okay, it's because of your religion? Okay, well, that's strange, but you realize that your religion is going to cause you mental problems, right? And this is like, Muslims have this experience. Um, so what is the cause of that when you, or what is the impact of you viewing your religion as literally destroying you mentally? But do we take our understanding of what is natural and what is, you know, in the case of hijab, who decides what is appropriate to cover or not cover, right? Who gets to decide that? Is it just a cultural thing? Or who decides like what kind of behavior is conducive to your health mentally or otherwise, to your flourishing in this life? Like who, do, who, who gets to set those terms? Well, how about our creator, right? Doesn't that make more sense than just whatever is culturally convenient? And that's the other problem is that uh, so much of Western culture is unmoored and unanchored from anything. And that's why you see these uh, uh, cultural revolutions every few decades. Um, prior to the year 2000, maybe, look at the statistics on the acceptance of certain same-sex sexual behavior. Um, they're very different than they are today. So what changed? Is it just that people came to their senses? Like, this is not even within 10 years or 20 years, that's not even one whole generation. It's the same people, you know, who had one view, and now it's a completely different view. Was there just, people are now more moral? Are we continuously discovering moral truths? Like, how is that possible? Like, what is, what is the theory there? And it seems implausible. It just seems like, no, it's just cultural changes. Culture changes, and people... If you don't have an anchor to anything, then you're going to go with the flow and you're not even going to notice that you're moving, right? That's the whole point of being unanchored, is that you're swaying with the water, but you can't even perceive the motion. For Muslims, though, it's different because we are anchored. We do have 
a normative tradition that we look to, and that's our bedrock. And so even if we don't maintain that anchor, we can still recognize that there are these big changes that are happening culturally. Um, yeah, so these are things that we need to be aware of. And what's happening today also, just as a final point before concluding, um, the process of colonization and imperialism has not subsided. The same forces that have been used for the past 200 years are still in effect um, domestically and in terms of foreign policy. Um, domestically, you can see it's certain Muslims, certain political organizations, Muslim political organizations that get the government funding. And you have to have a certain ideology to get that funding. Um, you have to be okay with certain kinds of programs and certain political positions in order to get that funding. And that's a big problem because some of those positions in no subtle terms contradict Islam and are contrary to Islam. Um, look at NGOs. Okay, These are the... Uh, organizations that are going to the Muslim world and spreading certain values, right? Certain Western enlightened values, millions of dollars, billions of dollars under the guise of aid, foreign aid, is being funneled into these NGOs. They're going to places like Egypt, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and spreading certain kinds of values okay and the goal the way that they describe it is this is development we're trying to develop um, the third world or we're trying to improve economic we're trying to empower Muslim women we're trying to empower families that's the facade the reality is that there is a very clear social program socialization program that you are spreading in order to, to advance your Western political goals and economic goals. L domestically, I mentioned funding. Uh, uh, you know, who's invited to the White House, right? Who's invited to White House iftars, especially during Obama's time, right? Um, there's a very clear profile um, of the m kinds of Muslims who are put in these positions. And I'm not saying that everyone who's invited to the White House or gets accepts that invitation is, you know, uh, a secret agent or anything like that. But, like, we have to be a little bit less naive about who's being promoted. Um, and then look at media portrayal. What kind of Muslims are featured in mainstream media, whether it's on the news or through TV shows or movies? Typically, there's just two. Uh, categories. You have the extremist, fundamentalist, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, scary, evil, bad Muslim, okay? And then you have the enlightened, liberal, progressive, Reza Aslan uh, Muslim, Linda Sarsour, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. Um, those are the types of Muslims that are featured. Uh, in mainstream media. What about Muslims that are committed to their faith, they're reasonable, they're, they're speaking in the uh, language uh, that people know in this country and in, in the West generally, are from this country, have been born and raised here, are devout, practicing, take their faith seriously, uh, take Islam, Islamic law seriously, are able to articulate themselves, you're not going to see them on CNN. You're not going to see them on Fox News or you're not going to see a TV show dedicated to that. You're going to see people like Aziz Ansari. Um, you're going to see people like Reza Aslan, people who will openly admit that Islam needs to be reformed. Islam needs to be reinterpreted. I mean, they have different ways of saying the same thing, but that's the underlying message. And so that's not a coincidence. That's not by chance. It's very deliberate. It's very deliberate who gets to be on what platform. 
And again, this is perfectly in line with what has been done by colonialization, which Muslims got the positions at the top universities, Al-Azhar and so forth, which Muslims were put in front of, were, were put in governmental <clears throat> office, which Muslims were put in front of the TV cameras, uh, were put in the newspapers. You had to have a specific ideology of reform if you're going to be promoted by the powers that be, the colonial powers. And the same exact thing is happening today uh, throughout the Muslim world. Recently in Saudi, this has been a big problem if you paid attention. So we need to be aware of this. And what is the ideology that is a basis of all of this? It's liberalism. It's liberalism. That's my message, the takeaway. If you don't remember anything of all of this bloviating that I'm doing, it's that liberalism is, a, in no uncertain terms, an enemy and uh, agent for destroying Islam. And again, don't take my word for it. Even non-Muslim academics have attested to this. There's decolonial studies. Read Joseph Massad, Islam and Liberalism, respected tenured professor, uh, I believe, at Columbia University. Read his book, Islam and Liberalism. And his entire thesis is that liberalism was designed by European thinkers in contradistinction to and as a reaction to Islam. This is his thesis, and he justifies it very compellingly. It's a fantastic book. You should definitely read it, Islam and Liberalism by Joseph Massad, and verify to yourself that this is actually the case, if you don't want to take my word for it. So what are the takeaways here? And you know, the, the majority of what I've said has been pretty negative, um, but what positive practical takeaways are there? The one takeaway that I would say is important, we need to have a 100-year vision as a community. We need to think about the implications of our choices for the next generation, the second to the next generation, and so forth. Um, that kind of thinking is absolutely necessary on the individual level and the institutional level. At the individual level, you have to think about it because you have children, right? And your children will have children and so forth. At the institutional level, I also another big takeaway is that we have to think seriously about what it means to be mainstream. I'm not saying that being mainstream is something that is negative in and of itself, because it's not. I would love it if um, people like you and me were mainstream in American culture. but. Does being mainstream come at the cost of sacrificing our deepest religious commitments? If so, then maybe mainstreaming ourselves is not the best option. Maybe mainstreaming ourselves is going to come at too high of a cost that will sacrifice our viability as a community in 50 years, maybe even in 10 years. So, and, and this is something that you often hear from Muslims, most, I would say more so immigrant Muslims than black Muslims and other subcategories of the American Muslim population, is that, oh, we need to follow the path of Jewish Americans. Look at the success that Jewish Americans have in mainstreaming their community in, Amer in American society over the past 50 years. And this is not very smart for many different reasons. You know, I could cite you the hadith about, uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about following them unto, even onto the liz, uh, lizard hole, for example. You know the hadith. Um, but just look at what has happened to the Jewish American community. And again, don't take my word for it. Um, there was a great article. Um, I forgot exactly where it was published, but it was written by a Jewish American who said, Liberalism has destroyed the Jewish community. Liberalism has destroyed the Jewish community. And what he says in that article is that 50% of Jewish Americans don't really believe in God. Either they're, they are outright atheists or they have serious doubts that God even exists. 
50%. And only 16% of Jew Jewish Americans think that being Jewish has anything to do with Talmudic law, Jewish traditional law. So is that the kind of end state that we want for ourselves as a Muslim community? Do we want in 50 years only 50% of American Muslims to believe in Allah or to have any you know, kind of conviction in Allah? Um, do we want only 16% of American Muslims to think that Islamic law, the Sharia, what Allah has commanded and what Allah has given to us of uh, behavior and ethics internally and externally, we only want 16% of Muslims to think that that's important. Like, is that really something that we want for ourselves? If not, then maybe we should rethink uh, following in the footsteps of other communities who have been decimated by liberalism and by this desire to be mainstream at any cost. Again, being mainstream, no problem with it in and of itself, but what is the cost of that? And is it a cost that we can pay? And finally, some more practical advice. Um, there is a very important hadith where the Prophet wasallam has said that a group of my ummah will continue victoriously adhering to the truth until the last hour. A group of my ummah will continue victoriously adhering to the truth until the last hour. So we need to very practically think of ourselves and aspire to be in that group. Okay? This is our life raft in the storm. Okay? We need to be laser focused on making sure that we are part of this group. And how do you do that? Well, the first step is, do we really know the basics of Islam? Do we know what is individually obligatory, fard ayn, upon us? Have we studied and learned the requirements of tahara, of salah, of prayer, of zakat, of hajj, of um, you know, the beliefs, the pillars of belief? Do we know who Allah is? Do we know about Malaika, the angels, the books, the messengers, the last day, Qadr, all of the required pillars of belief? Have we studied them? Okay, these are individual requirements as Muslims that we have to know because God will question us. On the last day, when we're standing before Allah, these are the things that we're accountable for. Have we really studied these on an individual level? Are our masajid and organizations emphasizing this and making sure that there is a minimum level of knowledge that our youth are uh, attaining? These are very practical questions, and it's not for lack of resources. You don't need to go to Mauritania. You don't need to travel to Azhar or Medina to learn how to make wudu properly how to make ghusl. You don't need to know, need to travel across the world to do that. There are plenty of imams, mashallah, at all the masajid across the United States who are teaching this and can teach this on a regular basis. Right? So it's not for lack of resources that we cannot attain this knowledge. So that's one practical step is to make sure that you're covered yourself that you've attained that knowledge. The second point is that get married. You know, if you can, if that's what you want, not ev everyone has to get married. And there are certain, there's a fiqhi discussion about who is required to get married and, or who doesn't have to and so on and so forth. But if you can and you have that desire, then get married and try to have as many children as possible to your capabilities and to you know what you can manage but strive to have a bigger family strive to have more children if you can and this the Im impact of this and the benefit of this is that within one generation of doing this within two generations three generations 
there is this demographic force, right? There's a demographic force of Muslims who you can't build institutions without numbers. That's the basics of it. And we should have children to the extent of our capabilities with the assumption that we're going to teach them the basics and necessary knowledge for being good Muslims and being good human beings, right? If you're just going to have kids and they're going to end up <laughs> being thugs and you know criminals or whatever, ingrates, no, that's not what I'm saying. You want to make sure to be able to teach them and bring them up with tarbiyah so that they're strong believers and strong members of the Muslim community. And if we do that very deliberately, it's not, we're not talking about change in a hundred years. We'll see the impact of that within a generation, two generations. And this is happening in Europe. Islamophobes and anti-Muslims in Europe are in crisis mode right now because the birth rates between Muslim, Muslims and non-Muslims is so divergent, is so disparate. Uh, Muslims are having too many, too many children is the way they, descri they describe it. And so churches are closing down, synagogues are closing down, but mosques are being built and churches are becoming mosques. And so this is very alarming to anti-Muslims. Um, so that will just indicates to you the impact, the demographic impact with having children and this will also uh, counteract the attrition that I mentioned earlier, that 30% of Muslims or 30% of people who are raised Muslims leave Islam. We can counteract that through knowledge and through uh, this kind of demographic um, program, which is kind of a weird way to say it, but <laughs> just have kids. That's all I'm saying. Just have kids. Inshallah. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair for Daniel for the great talk. And now we are going to open up the discussion for questions from the audience. So please. What are the sources for the statistics that you mentioned about the Muslim population in Europe and the Okay, so the question was, uh, what are the sources for the statistics that I cited? Um, the one on um, American Muslims who believe that traditional Islam needs to be reinterpreted, that's from Pew. Pew does a lot of these surveys. The one on the acceptance of uh, homosexuality is also from Pew. The one on the attrition of Muslims is, I don't believe, from Pew, but I forgot exactly. Um, it's from a reliable source, I can get that for you. Um, but yeah, that's that was the number looking at the Muslim American community and over a generation they, they surveyed. And, and no, maybe that is from Pew too because they looked at other religious groups as well. They looked at Christians, uh, different subsets of Christianity and Hindus and Muslims were one of the least likely to a trip. Muslims were the least likely to leave if they were raised as Muslims. Hindus were the most least, or were the least likely. Then it was Muslims, um, and then different Christian groups. But overall, it's a crisis of people leaving organized religion. Oh, here's a paper. Imam Ghazali said that half of the burden of the sin of Muslims leaving the religion belongs to religious people and groups that have caused people to run away from religion. Do you think it's fair to put all the blame on liberalism? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, this is not like... Liberalism, I'm arguing, is a major factor. Um, is it the only factor? No, I'm not committed to that. There are other factors. Um, cultural practices. There are certain cultural practices that have proliferated in certain regions of the Muslim world that are very anti-Islamic. Um, and 
have only driven Muslims into the arms of liberalism and apostasy because they say, look at how Muslims are treating you know, women, for example. Um, look how uncivilized this is. In reality, those practices that are mistreating women are un-Islamic. And the proof of that is look at what the ulama, the scholars, have said about those practices you know, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago. But the average Muslim doesn't have that knowledge or that education. And so they see, they associate and conflate those cultural practices with Islam. And so they view those practices as immoral and barbaric. Therefore, that means Islam is immoral and barbaric. Therefore, we leave, we're going to leave Islam. So yes, certainly there's enough blame to go around and we have to be proactive in addressing these kinds of issues as a community, but let's also not lose sight of liberalism. More question? Yes. yes. Uh, how do you see Muslims, you know, engaging in civic engagement that can still allow them to be, you know, uh, authentically with the Islamic tradition? Do you think there's examples of more way Muslims can engage? Yeah, as far as civic engagement and how Muslims can participate in that, I think it's very clear of the kinds of situations where Muslims have to make compromises to their faith in order to practice. So there are certain venues where that becomes problematic. I think on the level of national politics, it's often more fraught of a situation, but in terms of local politics, and Muslims be involved in local levels of government, usually there are not as many ideological issues um, to face in that context. I do think that it's good for Muslim Americans to be involved in different levels of government uh, agencies and institutions. Um, I, I think that is very practical for our community and there are individuals who are in organizations like Department of Homeland Security or other kinds of agencies um, and they do a lot of good for the Muslim community from their position and within their spheres of influence. I think there's no problem with that again as long as they're aware of anything that might affect their faith personally but I think the Muslim community needs to have a healthy or Muslim religious institutions need to have a healthy distance from people involved at that level of government because it creates this conflict of interest and um, this situation where Muslims are associating or are conflating religious authority and political authority. If you look at Islamic history, and this is something that I've mentioned uh, quite a bit over the past few days, is there was this fear uh, or this caution from the, the great scholars uh, of our tradition not to be too cozy with the sultan, not to be too cozy with political power. And they kept their distance such that they would, it went to the extent where they wouldn't even accept gifts from the sultan. They wouldn't accept gifts from the sultan because they're afraid that people would think that they were legitimating the political authority and the sultan. And even if the sultan is fine today and mashallah doing everything right you don't know what he's going to be doing tomorrow and so they didn't want people to associate politics with religion um, so there was this healthy distance and there are so many stories of that and it led to the torture as these sultans and uh, khulafa became frustrated that oh why isn't Imam Ahmed for example um justifying my rule or justifying my policies, I'm going to force him to do so. So they were tortured, imprisoned, and so forth. You know, where, where are examples of people who are willing to take stands like that today in our community? I'm very against uh, people, you know, scholars saying things like, I march with Linda, right? Because for all intents and purposes, you know, no disrespect, but Linda Sarsour is a political uh, 
um, actor. She's acting with political aspirations. And if she's also being positioned as a religious role model, that can lead and has led to a lot of problems in people's understanding. Because she has political positions that she takes. I don't know what's in her heart, but she's advocating for things that are deeply un-Islamic. And if the generation of Muslims today are looking up to her as a role model, then they'll think that, oh, well, this is religiously appropriate and legitimate because, and if we had any doubts of that, well, Sheikh Fulan has said, I, I march with Linda. So, I mean, what's the impact of that? This is not rocket science. And we're not new, new to this, right? We have a very extensive tradition of how to manage religion and politics. But unfortunately, we seem to have distanced ourselves and forgotten that. Yes? Um, what do you think about uh, the idea of voting for exactly evil? Like, you know, when Hillary was running against Trump, people would want to support Hillary, you know, even though Hillary was bombing Muslim countries and such, but just because they, they don't want Trump to, you know, they think of her as lesser evil than Trump. So the question is, um, on the level of national politics, voting for the lesser of two evils? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that national politics is so annoying. Um, I hate the election cycle. Um, it's, yeah, it's mind-numbingly stupid. Um, and I think that really the distance between Democrats and Republicans is not really that wide. Like, they have consensus on a lot of issues. As far as Muslims are concerned, there was consensus. Like, sure, Donald Trump was, you know, saying, spewing all of this garbage about Muslims, but Hillary Clinton accepted his basic premise that Muslim Americans are only valuable as an asset in the war against terror. And other than that, I. She, she's very good at re respectability politics and saying the right things, but her track record on certain Muslim policies were, was atrocious. So I argued at that time that, well, fine, we'll ex I'll concede, vote for the lesser of two evils, but is Clinton the lesser of two evils? I think there is, you could have made the argument, I made the argument that she was not. Um, and I think my predictions were true. And so there's an article that I wrote for Muslim Matters, uh, how Donald Trump is surprisingly good for Muslims. And I got a lot of hate for that. <laughs> um, this was like back in September of last year. So, but you can check that out and see my argument and see if it lived true to my claims. Yeah, so I won't rehash it here. Oh, and I, I wanted Bernie Sanders to, to win. <laughs> Just put that out there. But evil Hillary sabotaged the man. Yes, I'm not. During the election season, you had given an example about a train that's going to run over three people. And you could save those three people by killing one person. Mm -hmm. The trolley problem. Exactly. Moral philosophy. In an age where you're kind of in the West where we're being told you can either, either be conservative or liberal, what's your suggestion for moving forward? Is it starting a third group? Is it opting out, which is what you posed when you posted that? I was wondering if you could just comment on that. So the, should I rehash the trolley problem? Or the whole point of that example? Um, so, there is a certain version of the trolley problem that they explain in moral philosophy where imagine that you're on a bridge and under the bridge are train tracks and the train tracks um, diverge and on one track, on one side, three people are tied up and on the other side, only one person is tied up. And you're standing on the bridge and you have your friend 
or not a friend, a stranger who is particularly overweight, would you push that person onto the track in order to diverge the train from hitting three people and only hitting one person? So the net effect is that you save more people. And so that's the lesser of two evils if you do that. If you do nothing and you don't push um, this obese person over, then more people will die. So what choice do you make? If you go by the logic of the lesser of two evils, which is called a consequentialist um, approach, um, then you will push that person. But there's other, other considerations other than what is the ends here. And that consideration is, well, I don't want to kill someone. Like, I don't want to bring myself to end someone's life. And sometimes things will happen and I don't need to intervene. And it would be immoral of me to make that choice and to, you know, actually sacrifice a person. I'm not in a position to make that kind of decision. So that kind of moral reasoning is ca called deontological uh, moral reasoning or Kantian moral reasoning. So th that's why I brought up the trolley problem is that maybe we need to opt out, okay, because voting for the lesser of two evils is still really bad and has these moral implications that we have to seriously consider. At the end of the day, do I want to vote for someone who is going to be responsible for bombing uh, all these Muslims, innocent Muslims, um, droning all these innocent Muslims, um, furthering genocide in different parts of the world? It might be the lesser, there might be greater genocide that's happening, but maybe I need to opt out of that situation. So that was the whole motivation behind citing the trolley problem in moral philosophy. But as far as Muslim engagement, I think we need to have principled engagement. Uh, we have the opportunity to say that, okay, the, there's the conservative right, the liberal left. This is our perspective. This is our religions telling us these are values that will lead to the benefit, not only of Muslims, but of mankind overall. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that our religion is relevant and has uh, guidance for humanity and society in general? If we, if we do believe that and really have internalized that, then that will guide us into principled engagement, compassionate engagement, where we're concerned about our non-Muslim neighbors and brothers and sisters in humanity. Um, that's the kind of compassion that we should have that would motivate us to take what God has said, the creator of Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, at his word that this deen is to the benefit of humanity if it is implemented and practiced. <clears throat> and so, I mean, this is a mu much longer discussion, but uh, if we're more pensive or more hesitant or we haven't really internalized the value, then we're going to make mistakes, we're going to slip up, we're going to make compromises that we shouldn't be making. We're not going to be guided by wisdom. We're not going to be guided by uh, baraka. Okay? Uh, there's so much blessing and baraka in abiding and by uh, these truths, these timeless truths of our faith. And as soon as we start distancing ourselves from that, then it's bad news. Uh, bad news. Can I follow up? Sure. Follow so, up. Um, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but you know, aside if we're trying to follow our faith and navigating through our faith where we should go and how we should support, um, you know, local causes, national causes. But if we end up asking, you know, the people of knowledge, the ulama in the West, then you have an example like at RIS, how it happened when Sheikh Hamza was asked about Black Lives Matter. And we're just going to throw scholars under the bus, you know, whenever we don't like an answer or a clarification after that answer. You know, what, where do you see, that's also a result of liberalism, um, but I mean, would you suggest going down that road, or would you just suggest, you know, opting out? 
who going down that road? Uh, like American Muslims, you know, should we ask uh, the people of knowledge before we engage in any political uh, group, engage with them, march with them, stand with them, or should we just opt out um, and try and just reflect on where we stand as individuals instead of joining uh, a civil rights group, for example? No, there's, there are many causes that Muslims should support. I think that Muslims should support um, Black Lives Matter. The thing is that that movement has been co-opted by a very aggressive, progressive, liberal strand, right? Um, but Black Lives Matter originally was about police brutality and the injustices of the so-called criminal justice system that is putting um, one out of every three black men into prison at some point in their lives and killing black people right and left using all kinds of brutal means. This is, I think, something Muslims have to support um, for no other reason than 30% of the Muslim community is black. So do we not care about, you know, if we don't care about that, what should we care about? So no, I think that we, there are clear social issues that Muslims have to support. That being said, I think our scholars um, can consult with other people who have expertise in some of these trends and the intellectual history of liberalism and admit, like, not everyone can study everything, right? You can't be um, an expert in everything. And if we look at our, the ulama of the past, they also were consulted with different experts in different fields in order to opine correctly on a certain issue and to issue their um, fatawa or their opinions on any kind of political or social, social situation. So I, I, I don't think that the ulama should cloister themselves and separate themselves from the realities, they need to be actively involved in guiding the community and being the moral exemplars. Can they consult on certain issues? You know, Allahu Anam, I think there's always room for improvement. Yes? Follow up for the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter thing. I'm on their website now and I went to about, and it says, going down, it says, as organizers who work with everyday people, Black Lives Matter members see and understand significant gaps in movement spaces and leadership. Black liberation movements in this country have created room, space, and leadership mostly for black heterosexual cisgender men, <laughs> leaving women, queer, and transgender people, and others either out of the movement. And so this is something they're supporting as of now. So what, what do you think? Uh, like I said, there's Black Lives Matter that was co-opted as a brand, and they created this um, very progressive, ag aggressive, LGBT normalization agenda, but Black Lives Matter originally was not involved with that. Um, they're trying to co-opt civil rights in general, as they always have, and this is something that Malcolm X wrote about, uh, or he, he, there's a speech where he addresses it very directly. He says that the white liberal has co-opted the civil rights movement, the white liberal has derailed the civil rights movement for, for his own ends. And he denounces the white liberal, okay? Who are the white liberals today? They're the ones who are pressing for, you know, the normalization of certain sexual behaviors and practices. Um, look at how much, you know, normalization and success LGBT activism has had in a very short period of time versus how much success the civil rights movement has had. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the same kind of oppression that has been happening in this country for decades and generations is still happening against black people. Where's their advancement, right? Um, and this is just like with Black Lives Matter, just another example of white liberal co-optation of civil rights and self-determination for the black community. Does that make sense?
makes sense because a lot of people ask me this. Is it problematic to still associate with the name Black Lives Matter since now that's what they Don't do? associate, yeah. If it's com you're uncomfortable with hashtag Black Lives Matter, avoid it. Just say that you're opposed to police brutality. This is injustice. It's despicable. We need to hold people accountable for gunning down black people for no reason. Um, you know, I have friends who will say that if I'm late for the bus, I can't run to catch the bus in public. Really? Why? Why can't you run? Do you not see the color of my skin? If I'm running down the street, people think like I'm a criminal. They call the police, right? If a cop sees me running, they'll stop me and question me and maybe even arrest me and hassle me and brutalize me. So if I'm late for something, I don't run. I just have to calmly walk. Isn't that like shocking? That the level of subjugation in your daily life, like you can't even briskly walk down the street to catch the bus. It's just unbelievable. So if you don't feel comfortable using the word Black Lives Matter, at least uh, support the underlying cause and speak out against it or speak out in support of it. Oh, Niall. One of the aspects that has been discussed about the, with the election of Trump has been that this is a time for the Muslim community to recalibrate you know, and, and reorient itself, where does it find itself, especially as it now, in some cases, is forced to look for allies on the right to try to find links. Places maybe that should have been obvious from the beginning, right, on issues like same-sex marriage and abortion. Um, but in in establishing those kinds of relationships and principal engagement, not with those who are in opposition to us, but those who are potential allies, what are, what are some of the guidelines for that kind of engagement, such that perhaps some of the mistakes that were made in those forms of engagement are not repeated? Yeah, so I think there are opportunities for Muslims to, and Muslim organizations to ally with uh, the black church, for example. Black church is politically conservative. Um, they align with us on a lot of social issues. Um, and there are other groups, there are other Christian groups um, and organizations that have reached out to Muslim organizations. And Muslim organizations have said, no, we don't want to partner with you. We don't want to ally with you. Um, and I can give you very big examples of that. Um, but as far, and I encourage that kind of principled engagement as far as what to watch out for, um, I think within so-called interfaith engagement with Christian and Jewish groups, um, there are theological uh, issues involved and it's not as fraught because when it comes to a different religion, you can understand very clearly, okay, this is their theology and this is our theology. But with liberalism, it's not viewed as a theology. It's not viewed as a religion when in fact it is. It is its own religious, you can conceive of it as its own religion. Because it has doctrines. It has books. It has prophets. Right? And I mean this in the sense that you can abide by it. Huh? It has two kinds of Two kinds of prophets, like? Well, liberalism is a term into neoliberalism. Sure. Prophets, but I mean, th those are definitely related. Milton sure. Friedman thought of it as a religion. Right, right. So, yeah, we can think of it as a religion, but if you're not aware of that, then it can subtly influence you without knowing it. Um, so that's why liberalism is more noxious and dangerous. But as far as interfaith, Muslims sometimes do fall into certain theologically problematic practices with that and it's it's more of a technical discussion like you can sit down with Christian and Jewish neighbors to talk about different issues but make sure you're not co-opted by Zionists for example um, 
shout out to Muslim Leadership Initiative, MLI, or whatever it's called. Uh, make sure that um, another thing to watch out for is it's not permissible to attend the religious functions of other groups, like going to Christian mass. That's problematic because it's a ritual. Muslims shouldn't be partaking in that. That doesn't mean we can't go to the church after mass or after services and, and talk and invite, have a meal together. So there are, cer there are certain specific issues with interfaith that you have to be aware of. And I mean, it's also interfaith on a more theoretical level, broadly conceived is some of the underlying philosophy behind it is that all religions are essentially the same. All religions are essentially the same, so we can all get along. It's true, we can all get along, but it has to be principled. And no, it's, you know, as a Muslim, I'm a Muslim because Islam is the truth. And yes, you, as a Christian, differ with me on that, but we can still get along, we can still discuss, but I don't need to buy into this kind of universalism of all religions being the same, which is, again, originating within the liberal tradition, philosophically. I don't have to buy into that to engage with you and be neighborly, support you, um, help you when you need help. We need that kind of compassionate, principled engagement, prophetic engagement um, in this country. Many opportunities for that. In the back. Question. I, I just disagree with one of your comments. I think you're painting interfaith with a broad paintbrush. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. As Muslims, we don't partake in rituals when we do attend interfaith. But I believe as Muslims, we should encourage, especially people who do know their own religion, the basis of Islam, and practice go and observe other people's rituals. And I, and I don't believe necessarily children, but go and observe because seeing the other side of how they do uh, perform their rituals and perform their worship, I think only empowers us as Muslims. Uh, it, you know, supports what we believe in because we can then look at other people's rituals and compare it to what we have been taught as Muslims and figure out how much more privileged and like blessed we are to have the religion we do have. So I'm not quite sure if I agree with you in terms of saying, you know, interfaith is, uh, we're saying that everyone else is the same. I don't, I think what we're saying in interfaith is we have similar uh, goals. We have similar goals such as respect each other's faith and we agree to disagree. That is what the underlying thing of interfaith is. Not necessarily saying we're all gonna be, you know, walking into heaven together necessarily. Okay, uh, so you disagree with what I said in terms of interfaith. What you just described, I agree with a lot of it, so I don't know where the disagreement is. I do think that, yes, knowledgeable people who are established or they're scholars in their own right, yeah, there is a benefit in being aware of trends and being aware of different religious traditions in order to better speak to that, uh, to their own communities. Um, there was an example where uh, at, in Harvard's community, there was this event that they advertised. There was a certain evangelical group um, and they advertised this event of a former Ayatollah from Iran converted to evangelical Christianity and was born again. And he's coming to talk about his conversion on campus and so myself and the chaplain at the time and my teacher uh, and mentor uh, Sheikh Taha Abdul Basir we went to that event and observed um, because we want to be aware of okay what is this Ayatollah uh, this grand Ayatollah of Iran that has converted to Christianity and I mean we we're welcome there they knew that we were there um, it was an open public event. 
very interesting to say the least. It's a funny story. It turns out the guy was actually not an Ayatollah. He was an aspiring actor uh, who wanted to go to Hollywood uh, to from Tehran. And he kind of got stuck in Germany uh, in trying to get his visa. And he was like in his hotel room and there's this Gideon's Bible. And he just opened it and like at that that night like his visa got him approved so he found jesus <laughs> to go to hollywood um it was very awkward uh because that particular uh denomination of christianity at one point at the end of the program they were saying he was saying oh i feel the presence of jesus christ coming into the room and he'd had this whole like theatrics about like it wasn't exactly speaking in tongues but if you know what that is it was bordering on that so me and Sheikh Tahar are sitting there like this <laughs> what's going on here I mean he was not phased by it if you know Sheikh Taha, I mean he's mashallah but for me as this undergrad like yeah so it was very and, and me being the immature person that I was I was like Look at these, you know, look how ridiculous this is. And he was like, well, actually, this is a very sad. This is a very sad state um, that, you know, this would happen and you have this kind of, these practices. So he put it in perspective, mashallah, with his wisdom. But that's an example of going to, it wasn't an interfaith event, but we went to it and participated in observing. It wasn't ritualistic, um, but... So I think I, I'm on the same page as, as you. Do we have to break from over? Um, five more minutes. Five more we minutes. can take another question, yes. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, two, two, two questions. Like Allah, Daniel, very, very good and inspiring, inshallah. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is, uh, you highlight a very big problem want to balance by asking you what are some of the positives that you see that could lead us in a good direction so that we don't feel overwhelmed in a negative way and maybe even react to that in a, in a negative way internally. And then the other question is, you posed the challenge, and it's a big challenge and it's an overwhelming challenge, and I'll maybe even dare say it's not just a challenge to the Muslim community liberalism doesn't know, you know, doesn't know a certain faith. I mean, it's, it's against any faith. And, and I wouldn't even put it that it's against the faith. You, you mentioned that liberalism is a weapon that's being used. A weapon is something like poison that, you know, people want to poison, but they don't look at it as poison. They look at it as something very good that they themselves are drinking. And so they'd like to share it with everybody else. not that they're looking at it as a weapon, they're looking at it as their good news, just like we have good news that we're sharing, and we probably shouldn't even be surprised that they're doing this, the surprise should be that we're not doing our part in terms of you know, how we can not just counter that so that we can be strong, but so that we can share our you know, perspective and our good message. But anyways, my second question is, what are the action items? Because sometimes also I'm afraid that can be very overwhelming, that it's such a big problem, and then people can be saying, well, who am I to make a dent? So what should I, as a college student or as a young person, you know, what can I do in order to help move the needle forward if that's uh, possible? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it can be overwhelming, and uh, I think the first step it is a practical step is to gain awareness um, and understand what liberalism is and that was the purpose of this entire talk and it's something that I've been writing about for quite a long time um, you can go onto my website muslimskeptic.com uh, or my Facebook page and see everything that I've written on this topic and my intention and purpose is to make people aware make Muslims 
aware non-Muslims too, because it affects them, as you mentioned. It's noxious to organized religion in general. Um, make people aware that this is a big problem. This is where this ideology is coming from. This is the impact of it. And awareness is the first step. Because if you don't know that there's a problem, you can't really address it. And I get pushback from Muslims saying that you're alarmist. You are just trying to ratchet people's emotions and you don't know what you're talking about. And so this is, I think, is willful ignorance. Um, and that's why I emphasize awareness as a very practical step. Because if, as we as a community, uh, individually and institutionally, don't realize that this is a problem, then we're going to continue to make the same mistakes. Um, awareness is the first step. And then as for other action items, you counter a lack of knowledge uh, by uh, fortifying yourself with knowledge. Um, again, that's very practical. It connects to our uh, hereafter, knowing the basics, knowing the fardain, the fara'id, extremely important. There's a knowledge gap. Um, we we're just talking about how, uh, on the car ride over here, how at some places they're teaching usul al fiqh, or they're teaching like, um, I don't know, higher levels of the Islamic sciences. And the students who are taking this, the Muslim students at the masjid, haven't really even studied fiqh. They haven't even studied, like, because it seems like a very dry subject uh, to go through a basic metan uh, uh, fiqh and understand tahara and salah and so forth. But that's what we're accountable for, first and foremost, on the Day of Judgment. So it's very practical. We have to do this. We have to encourage this institutionally. Another uh, practical step I mentioned, you know, within the family context, um, developing bigger families, extended families, abiding by the basics of Islamic ethics in terms of respect and honoring your parents, maintaining the ties of kinship. Um, this is something that I talked about in yesterday's uh, talk on feminism, but. Uh, Muslims need to inculcate uh, these, and Islamic law is uh, in support uh, and implicitly and explicitly establishes large family networks, and that's the vision of society that Islam encourages, um, a family-centric vision and model for society, and that vision is being constantly undermined in our modern world a practical way to address that is for us to abide by Islamic ethics in terms of relationship with our parents, relationship with our children, relationship with our you know, paternal, maternal uncles and aunts and cousins and so on and so forth. There are pra many practical things to do in order to inculcate those kinds of families and that's going to lead to all kinds of success. Finally, institutionally, I think our institutions need to support voices that are spreading this kind of message. Um, the more critical message that might not be politically correct, um, but is still necessary. And I don't mean me personally, anyone who is willing to come from an academic perspective and, and say the kind of unpopular things, we need to support those people and not blackball them and not throw them under the bus, not silence them, not disassociate with them it's something very easy and practical to do um, on an institutional level. What about Islamic school curriculum? How are we, uh, we have all these Islamic schools. Is there material that the teachers can take and pass on to their students so that they're aware of these challenges, these intellectual challenges, when they go into college? And college is where the onslaught is. The onslaught of liberalism happens in the college environment, not only academically in the classroom, but also socially. Um, you know, any students here, you're in the thick of it. So have we been able to educate and prepare our youth for that difficult journey, difficult and depressing and burdensome journey? Where, what provisions have we, provi have we given them? Um, unfortunately, we've been woefully inadequate in that regard. So. Our institutions need to dedicate resources, money, um, towards these kinds of initiatives, supporting scholars and researchers 
who are working on these issues, creating curricula, create, creating institutions, and so on and so forth to address it. And I, again, very practical steps that we can take for this. Yes? So just to follow up, so uh, again, I agree with almost everything that you said, but I, I, I do want to, it would be very helpful for the message if, if in promoting that message, for example, the journey is not depressing. The journey is extremely exciting because we have on our side the greatest weapon and the greatest uh, strength that nobody else has, which is a lot on our side. When we engage in the journey and when people, young people, look at the journey as a very depressing or very overwhelming journey, a lot of people, you know, won't take it. They'll feel scared even if they believe that it's an important journey. But adopting the understanding and the prophetic vision, the prophet faced a lot of problems. The fact that if we stand with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will help us and He will support us individually, as well as that Islam will not be defeated. This is per the hadith and the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Of course, that doesn't mean that we sit down and do nothing. We have to acknowledge the challenges, but also acknowledge the strength that's inherent in our faith, the strength that Allah promises to those who congregate for His sake in order to overcome. Yeah, I, I agree. I completely agree with uh, what you're saying. It's it's only depressing if you don't have that knowledge, right? It's only depressing and overwhelming if you haven't been fortified with that perspective and that uh, conviction in the truth. And unfortunately, the majority of our youth are not informed about this. So for them, it's a dire prospect but we should empower them. We should give them that hope. Um, and I agree, having a positive message is very, very important. And um, I appreciate your feedback on, in that regard. Okay, so there's more questions, but we're gonna stop now. And inshallah, we're gonna continue the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Brother Daniel.